Hi, good afternoon, any, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second session in Interface's uh, High Performance Building free webinar series. Uh, my name is Joe Dieno. I'm an associate principal and senior mechanical engineer with Interface Engineering uh, in our DC office, and I appreciate everyone taking uh, time out of their lunch hour to uh, talk about heating and cooling uh, with the city sewer. Um, just a couple housekeeping items before we launch into the presentation. Um, for those of you that signed up with your AIA number uh, when you registered, um, you will be able to get credit. Um, however, if you don't recall, if you provided your AIA number um, or if you signed up early before we had that uh, option available, you'll get an email after the webinar is over. And if you simply reply to that email with your AIA number, um, we will make sure that you get your uh, one credit. Um, this course is certified by the AIA, and it is course number M17-0683. Um, so with that, I think I will go ahead and get started. Uh, we have a couple housekeeping items since it is an AIA presentation. The first is uh, we're required to provide you with a course description, so I will just go ahead uh, and read that for you now. Um, so I'd like to thank you for joining Interface Engineering for an informative presentation on heating and cooling with the city sewer. Uh, this course was developed for design professionals in the field of architecture, engineering, and leaders for the built environment. Uh, the course focuses on advancing the understanding of sewer heat exchange systems and how they can be designed and implemented. Uh, the presentation explains the concept behind sewer heat exchange and how the systems function, as well as the variety of system types that are available. Um, consideration for the design of such systems and a case study example are also presented. Uh, the case study focuses on the sewer heat exchange system designed for the American Geophysical Union Building, AGU building. Um, this system is the first in the U.S. to be heated and cooled primarily from the city's municipal sewer system. So learning objectives. There are four learning objectives uh, for this presentation. Uh, one is to gain an understanding of the definition and attributes of a sewer heat exchange system. Uh, two, I'd like to learn about the various sewer heat exchange system types and their unique attributes. Three, uh, learn about the considerations which must be taken into account when designing a sewer heat exchange system. And four, uh, we'd like to discuss the specific design and the lessons learned from uh, the AGU headquarters building case study. So we'll go through the table of contents for this presentation. Uh, first, we're gonna start out with the obvious question, what is sewer heat exchange? Um, next, and perhaps even more important, the million dollar question of why would I wanna do this? Um, third, we will discuss the system types. Fourth, we will discuss uh, specific design considerations um, that both architects, engineers need to take into account um, when you go about designing such a system. Fifth, we will touch on the case study for the American Geophysical Union, uh, and there I'll, I'll take a deeper dive into uh, some of the design aspects that were specific for this project and the project that we, uh, and the design that we implemented for this project. And finally, at the end, uh, I will open it up to uh, a little question and answer session. I'm hoping to have uh, 10 or 15 minutes at the end where uh, any questions you might have at the end of the presentation, uh, you can use the uh, GoToWebinar tool has a section for uh, questions where you can ask questions and I will try to get through as many of those as, as I can. All right, so what is sewer heat exchange? Well, it has a lot of different names. You may hear it referred to as as many different things, but they're all essentially uh, talking about the same thing. So it may be called sewer heat recovery, sewer thermal, municipal heat recovery, or municipal heat exchange. And the scientific definition, I guess, is that it's simply the exchange of energy inherent to a wastewater source for building heating and or cooling demand. And what is wastewater? I think we're all pretty familiar with that, but it's basically anything that gets flushed down the toilets, Anything that goes down a drain, whether that's a shower, a sink, a dishwasher, a washing machine, etc., all of these um, wastewater streams can have a useful benefit. Um, it's not as common here in the U.S. market, um, so some of you may be familiar with this, and some of you maybe perhaps have never heard of it before. 
but it is a technology that's been around uh, for a little while in Europe. Um, they've done these uh, projects all over Europe, in Germany, and Switzerland, other locations, and as well as in Canada. And I like to tend to think of a, a sewer heat exchange system as sort of an analogy to a, a geothermal system, right? So perhaps you're familiar with, uh, you know, vertical borehole geothermal uh, heat exchangers. This is very similar to that in terms of its application, except for the uh, the major point of we're not utilizing the ground to do this. We're actually utilizing um, the sewer. So the million dollar question, why would I want to do this? So you ask the question of, you want me to bring sewage into the building. Um, this is a little bit counterintuitive, right? We spend a lot of our time as architects and engineers trying to get sewage out of the building. Um, so it seems a little weird that you would wanna bring it back in. But there are two main benefits um, that I'd like to discuss. Um, first, the building operations impact of energy usage in the United States. We're all very familiar and probably have heard many, many times uh, people talk about how much energy our buildings use. And so if we're really focused on any sort of path to sustainability or carbon reduction, it will rely heavily on reducing the energy use from building operations. So by tapping into you know, the moderate and relatively constant temperature of a wastewater source, we can then reduce our consumption for building heating and cooling. Another secondary benefit that perhaps in this region doesn't get discussed enough is on the water side. We tend to be very hyper-focused on energy, and sometimes we forget about, you know, net zero water, if that's a thing, or how close can we get to reducing our water usage. So one advantage of using a system like sewer heat exchange is that in lieu of a traditional chilled water system that may be a water-cooled chiller uh, with a cooling tower located on the roof, um, you can use the sewer to replace that cooling tower and therefore reduce your water usage. And it's not an insignificant quantity. Depending on the size of your building, it could end up being a very, very large amount of water. So for example, a traditional tower can use between two and three gallons of water per minute of operation per 100 tons of cooling. So if you have a relatively uh, large, say, office building or even a very large office building with hundreds of tons of cooling, over the course of a year, it can add up to hundreds of thousands of gallons of water per year. So now I'd like to dive into uh, the system types, and there are two different system types that I'd like to focus on um, as part of this presentation. So the first type is what we call modular heat exchange, and this is when wastewater is actually removed from the sewer to perform the heat exchange. And as the name suggests, modular, there are a lot of different components um, that build up this part of the system, right? So here you can see uh, the various components for one type of modular heat exchange system, where you have your sewer, and then essentially a, a collection area that we call or refer to as a wet well. So you will hear that referred to throughout the presentation. So the sewage goes by gravity to the wet well, and then it's pumped into the building to essentially what is referred to as the sewer heat exchanger. Um, there's various types of heat exchangers that can be applied. Uh, this image is showing essentially what is a, a built up shell and tube heat exchanger. And then from that heat exchanger, um, you have another, what I refer to as a, a companion piece of equipment. And the companion piece of equipment is really what's going to make, um, you know, chilled water, hot water, or potentially you'll distribute condenser water through the building. Um, that's really what serves the, the distribution for the heating and cooling within the building. So there's several different options when you're looking at these modular heat exchangers, and they're all relatively similar. However, there are differences. And when we talk about the design considerations um, later on in the presentation, these are the things that you'll have to keep in mind, right? So that there's more than one way to do this. They all eventually uh, will do the same thing in terms of transferring energy from a sewer into your building, but there are nuanced differences between the two. So this diagram shows another type of modular heat exchange. And while it's very similar uh, to the previous diagram that we were looking at, one thing to point out is that with this system, um, you take the water by gravity into the sewer, then you pump it into your building. And there, a lot of the filtration of that water is happening 
inside the building. And it's not necessarily better or worse to do it this way. It's just slightly different. And so each project is going to have to evaluate whether or not that makes sense for them. Um, secondly is the heat exchanger. Predominantly for modular heat exchange, there are two different types of heat exchangers that one could utilize. You could utilize uh, a shell and tube, as in the previous in image, or you could utilize uh, a plate and frame heat exchanger. And both types have advantages and disadvantages, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail uh, when we talk specifically about the heat exchanger component of the system. But again, it's something to keep in mind that these are the things that you have to evaluate uh, if you're going to move forward with uh, the design of, of one of these system types. The second type of sewer heat exchange is what is referred to as in-sewer heat exchange. And it's sort of, as the name implies, it's a heat exchanger that is in or sometimes is actually the sewer itself. Um, the predominant difference between the two system types is that when you're looking at an in-sewer heat exchange, the wastewater is actually not being removed from the sewer to perform this heat exchange. So that's considered one of the big advantages of, of trying to implement an in-sewer heat exchange system is that you're not having to bring wastewater into your building. And so, you know, those, those design aspects that one would have to, to take into consideration um, are actually lessened in this case. And essentially, the image that we have on the screen here is of the, um, the type that is the actual sewer itself. And so the way that this works is it's no different than, you know, a plate and frame or a shell and tube heat exchanger, except the heat exchange portion is essentially laid out throughout in the bottom of the sewer itself. Um, the piping is then run in the bottom of the sewer, and that distribution piping, that is your condenser, your building condenser water loop. And it is piped back into the gilt building. And very similar to the modular heat exchange, it is connected to essentially some companion piece of equipment, whether that's individual heat pumps uh, tied into a condenser water loop or a water to water heat pump that can potentially create uh, chilled water and hot water inside your building. Obviously, um, there, are, there are impacts to, to trying to use an in sewer heat exchange system. Um, this is something that you're going to see more often on what I would consider to be a district scale, because um, obviously it's, it's quite a bit of infrastructure to upgrade um, when you have this type of a system being applied, right? So oftentimes when there is a major uh, project replacing a large quantity of sewer on a district scale, you might look at something like this. Another type of in-sewer heat exchange um, is something that you would find uh, predominantly at maybe a wastewater treatment plant. Um, and this is where it's possible to put a heat exchanger directly into uh, some sort of uh, sewage treatment plant effluent channel. Um, it's actually not too dissimilar from the modular heat exchanger in that this is what is exactly in a modular heat exchanger. It's just taken out of the modular box and put directly into this effluent stream. Now, this is something that I'd like to mention when we do, the, do these presentations because I think it's important to understand all of the different types of systems that are out there, but this is one that I think is more of a, a next step type of application that we might see in the future when we start looking beyond uh, sewer heat exchange for one particular building and potentially applying it to uh, a much bigger uh, district type system. So now I'd like to get into a little bit more of the design considerations that one would need to make um, when they're designing one of these sewer heat exchange systems. So the first question I'd like to ask is, what is available? Now, I'm showing this image on the screen. It's not meant to show anything in particular other than it is a civil engineering drawing that shows all of the wastewater streams that are adjacent to the building. This is something that's extremely important to evaluate from the onset of a project if you're even thinking about doing sewer heat exchange. What's around your building? Are there main sources of uh, sewer running past the building? Are there multiple streams running around the building? Are they close enough to the building that you can easily connect to them without having to do a significant amount of, uh, of infrastructure? Is it a sewer alone? Is it in DC we have combined storm and sewer? So all of these things need to be taken into account 
when you're starting to think about you know utilizing a system like this on your building. The second question, and perhaps even more important, is what is allowed? Am I allowed to do this? Because this is such a new thing, um, not only here in the District of Columbia, but in the United States in general, um, a lot of municipal water and sewer authorities are not familiar with these types of systems, right? So I can't stress enough how important it is in the design. And when we um, continue on into the case study, I'll, I'll elaborate on this a little bit more, but it is absolutely critical that if you think that this is something that's gonna make sense for your project and you wanna pursue it, you must get into contact with the local water and sewer authority because they are the ones that own and operate and maintain these sewers. And so they will have a, a lot of say into how these systems are going to be implemented. And not to scare anybody away, but it is a big hurdle and it's something that requires a lot of coordination. and you know, a lesson learned from from our experience on the design of the AGU building was that it was very critical that very early on we determined with DC Water um, what was going to be allowed and whether they were open to this. And I think that we found that we had a really great ally uh, with the folks at DC Water who we worked with and they were willing to work with us. They were very interested in this, um, you know, a as a, a utility essentially they pro they're used to providing water but this raised the question of you know is there another type of utility that they could be providing to buildings uh, i.e you know this thermal storage uh, in their sewers the next step in the process and that needs to be considered is data and getting the data it's absolutely critical to understand what you have to work with at your specific building um, just to make an analysis of, you know, whether or not it's going to make any kind of sense to do this. If you have a very small sewage stream outside your building, that may preclude it, you from doing it. It may prove to not be feasible, depending on what your building loads are. Um, but the reason I'm showing this data set here is that we found out some very, very interesting things when we decided to, to put the monitoring into the sewer. And what you're seeing here is a period uh, in February, back from 2016, where we were fortunate enough to observe a, a snow melting event um, that happened right outside on Florida Avenue, right outside the AGU building. And we were able to gather the data and see what that impact was. Because again, if you're dealing with a combined storm and sewer system, like very uh, a lot of parts in DC are, there are going to be differences. You know, sewer heat exchange is great because you're viewing it like a geothermal system where uh, the conditions are very steady. Um, that can change when you have a combined system. And so what this is showing is that about five in the morning, uh, the temperature started to rise after, after it had snowed. And all of a sudden, the flow rate and the level of fluid in the sewer and the temperature started to change. And it changed in a very dramatic fashion. It went from about 3,500 gallons per minute to almost 30,000 gallons per minute in the course of about two and a half hours. And that resulted in a fluid rise of about 27 inches in the sewer itself and a temperature drop of six degrees. And then about five and a half hours after it started, the snow melting ended and the flow rates went back to what we would consider more average uh, the temperature rose back up to what we would consider more the average temperature. And so why is this important? Well, as designers, as engineers, you really can only design to what criteria that you have. You have to know what the criteria is. What are my flow rates? What's the minimum flow rate, the maximum flow rate? What type of temperatures am I going to be experiencing? So it's absolutely critical that you get this data and that you get this data at the source because there are going to be uh, differences depending on where you are at within a system. How deep is that pipe buried? How close is it um, to other streams coming into it? Is it a main? Is it a branch off of the main? All of these things are, are parts that need to be considered. And so this is the graphical representation of that data set that I had just shown, expanded actually over the course of several days. And what you can see, is that while there is variability in the system, in general, it has uh, a path that it follows. It will peak, 
it will come back down. Uh, the blue line is showing the sewer water temperature. And so each one of these valleys is essentially a 24 hour time period. So that you can see over 24 hours, the temperature in the sewer system will rise up, it steadies out, and then in the evening it will drop back down. And we found that this was very consistent uh, over the course of the year. And you could almost tell, you know, when upper Northwest uh, DuPont Circle woke up in the morning and started taking their showers because you see uh, going from a low temperature back to the high temperature in the day and then averaging out through the day. So it was very interesting information that we were able to get out of this. And the graph at the, uh, at the bottom in orange shows the, the sewer water flow in gallons per minute. And you can see that it's very consistent. There are some peaks and valleys. And then this here represents the snow melt event. So it's very important to know what types of things could be happening into the sewer, because if you're going to try to make connections uh, to an existing sewer, you need to have an understanding of, of what it is that you're up against, what the, the flow rates are, and what the actually the, the height of the, the water in the sewer is so that you can make your connections appropriately. So once you've decided that heat, sewer heat exchange is something that you want to explore, it's something that you want to do, uh, you've worked with your local municipal authority uh, to get their approval to, to move forward with the design process, um, then you need to start to think about, you know, which type of heat exchange makes the most sense for me. And so on screen now you can see, you know, some of the, the particulars about the system, um, you know, the modular heat exchange, obviously, it, it used quite a number of components. Uh, it needs a wet well. There needs to be some level of filtration from this wet well before you bring it into the building. Um, and you need to be evaluating, you know, what my sewage flows are and also what capacity do I need within my system. Um, when you're looking at an in-sewer heat exchange, again, you're not bringing any fluid into the building, but there are restrictions. Uh, similar uh, minimum flow rates are required. Um, a pipe, di pipe diameter becomes very critical. It needs to be 18 inches or larger, and actually much, much larger than 18 inches to, to really have a big effect. Uh, there's impact of what the slope of the piping is, and then all of these variables um, basically provide for a range of capacities. Um, I will say this, that when you're evaluating the two options, unless you have a considerable amount of sewage piping that can be easily replaced outside of your building. Um, typically, the in-sewer heat exchange, when you're looking at a one building application, is not necessarily going to be the most practical application. Um, so really, the focus is going to be then on these modular heat exchange options. And so, you know, some of the other considerations that, that, that one would have to make, um, some significant space is required. So while we may have been able to take a cooling tower off the roof and open up the roof space to rooftop amenities or whatever you would like to do up there, there's a trade-off. So now I need a little bit more mechanical room space uh, in the basement, in a garage level. Um, these things need to be taken into account when you start to think about, you know, what is going to make the most sense. Um, and then you need to think about what type of screening do I need to do, right? So we all know that, you know, in a sewer system, any number of things could be flowing through there. So a lot of, um, a lot of time needs to be spent figuring out, you know, what's the best screening system for me to apply. And then once I've made that determination, you know, what type of heat exchanger do I want to use? Does the shell and tube heat exchanger make sense? Does a, a plate and frame heat exchanger make sense? All of these things need to be explored because they are going to be different uh, from one project to the next. And so finally, once you've made your decision about what type of heat exchanger you think might make the most sense, you really need to jump into the numbers, right? You have to understand, um, you know, what your entering water temperatures are going to be. So the image at the top is essentially showing, uh, you know, one data set that was looked at um, for uh, a cooling scenario, right? So you have to decide what are the entering and leaving water temperatures coming from the sewer. And then almost just as importantly, what do I need inside my building? What type of flow rates am I looking at based on the uh, tons of cooling that are required or the amount of heat that's required? So the image on the bottom, the reason that I always include this because I think it's something that is worth mentioning. For any geothermal system, um, 
a lot of times we think about cooling only and we're dumping heat into the ground and we're continually dumping heat into the ground, but we're also trying to extract heat. And it's no different with the sewer heat exchange system. We're also trying to extract heat out of this water source. And so you can see, and again, these numbers are going to change uh, depending on your particular location, the characteristics of the flow. But if you're trying to extract heat from something that is 46 degrees, on the other side of the heat exchanger, it's going to be quite cold. And it's not impossible to do this, but there are very specific design considerations that need to be made if you have a very low temperature uh, sewage or combined storm sewer uh, uh, temperature. And that being on the, the primary side, on the building side, your condenser water loop is likely to go below freezing. And so then you're going to need to introduce some sort of antifreeze into the system. Um, traditionally in the industry, that would be some propylene glycol solution. But it's very important to work through these and know exactly what parameters um, that you're working with because, again, when you add propylene glycol to a system, it becomes less efficient uh, from a heat transfer standpoint than just normal water. And there's also impact on the amount of energy that's required to pump glycol through a building. So really, you need to evaluate where you're at, what's the minimum amount of glycol I might need to add into my uh, system, and then kind of go from there. So I'd like to jump into uh, the AGU case study now. Um, for those of you who participated last week, I think Roger gave a, a wonderful overview of what this building is. Um, if you were unable to participate, I believe you can go online and check out the presentation. Um, but for this particular building, we, again, I think I had mentioned it earlier, but I'll reiterate, we only explored the modular heat exchange options. Um, there were a couple of reasons why we did that. Um, the first was probably because the existing sewer that's in Florida Avenue, while it's very large and provided us with a great resource, um, it was 30 feet below the ground. And so the idea of having to dig up that amount of sewer and potentially replace it was kind of a non-starter uh, from the get-go. Um, we did, as I mentioned, uh, do some extensive uh, sewer monitoring to understand what our fluids level, levels were, velocities, flow, temperature. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, extensive coordination uh, with DC Water. So they were a, a great uh, advocate for this technology. They worked with us, um, but it wasn't just, you know, the MEP engineer and DC Water that made it happen for this project. It was really everyone involved in the project from the general contractor, the civil engineer, everyone was involved with making the system work. Um, and really without that amount of coordination between the different entities on the project, I'm not sure that we would have able or would have ever been able to make this system work. And then for this particular building, the, uh, the companion equipment, as I called it, uh, we ended up going with a, a water to water heat pump that could produce chilled water and hot water, uh, both individually and simultaneously. Um, and then when we were in the simultaneous mode of operation, we're actually able to recover energy when we're making chilled water to preheat the hot water. Um, and the reason that we decided to go that direction in this building was essentially the distribution system that was designed was a radiant distribution system. So we're using elevated temperature chilled water, low temperature hot water, and pairing it with a water to water heat pump uh, really made a lot of sense for this project. So back to the image of the civil uh, plan. When we started to do more research into this and, and figure out what was available to us, uh, we were very fortunate to find out that there was a substantial sewer main uh, or a combined storm sewer main uh, running down Florida Avenue. So that really shifted our focus a bit. Um, one of the things about this project was the, the number of different things that we were looking at um, for the system types. Um, we were thinking about using, you know, sewer heat exchange was one option. Doing geothermal by drilling wells in the garage was another option. And for a long time, we thought maybe maybe the, the, the sewer heat exchange would only play part of the role in the building in terms of satisfying uh, the heating and cooling demands in the building. But once we realized that we had such a substantial asset available to us, it really started to shift our thinking and make us you know, ask ourselves the question of, do you think that we could do everything that the building needs with this system? Um, it was a little bit of a nerve-wracking conversation, I would say, and this is sort of another lesson learned, 
is that you have to make sure that you're working with your owner and that they understand the technology that, that you're trying to design for them, that they understand the implications. Um, I will say that the, the AGU project was, you know, it was well positioned in terms of their willingness to look at these new technologies and, you know, frankly, what was available to us. We were very fortunate in that regard. So by working with them a lot and exploring this technology and reaching out to the various manufacturers that make these pieces of equipment and visiting sites to see where it was installed, you know, we were able to move forward with the idea that, you know, the sewer heat exchange system is going to be the heating and cooling source for the building. There is not going to be some secondary redundant system put in. Uh, and again, to put in a fully redundant system to the sewer heat exchange from a cost standpoint, it's just really not practical. Maybe on a very, very large application, you could have some level of redundancy. Um, but in the case of the, the HU building, which is an existing building, um, that really wasn't an option for us. So just to get into a little bit more of the details of exactly how this works, um, we went through this before, but uh, again, just to kind of point out all the different bits and pieces and, and start to elaborate in a little bit more detail how all of these things work for the AGU building. So we have our sewer line and we have our wet well. Um, the screening system, which we will get into a, a little bit more detail as well, um, particular for the HU facility, our screening system, the screening happens at the wet well. So essentially, what does that mean? Well, I hope everybody's done with their lunch because now this, this is the part where we have to start talking about how we're treating sewage. Um, essentially, what happens at the screening system is you're trying to separate uh, the liquids from the solids, right? So all we want to put into the building is the cleanest liquid possible. What the screening system does is it allows flow to come in at the bottom, separate the solids out, actually lift those solids back out of the stream and then deposit them back into the sewer downstream of where the water entered into the wet well. So once you've been able to do all of that, you pump this fluid um, via a set of pumps that we have, a submersible sump pump in the wet well into the building. Those go into our shell and tube heat exchanger. And then we were able to transfer that energy via the building condenser water loop to our water to water heat pump system. So it's very important to understand too, when we're talking about these heat exchangers, that at no point does the fluid to the tube fluid, either your building fluid or the effluent that's coming in from outside, ever touch. They're completely separate closed hydronic loops. And obviously, you know, for obvious reasons, it would need to be that way because we really don't want to have to deal with treating anything, you know, like sewage inside of the building. So a little bit more detail on the actual connections to the sewer and how we were able to go about that and you know the various design elements that came out of this. So what you're seeing here in this image uh, is essentially a, a Revit model, a 3D model of the actual sewer, the wet well, and ultimately what needed to be built into the sewer in order to allow us to make these connections. Um, the one thing that I would want to mention about this sewer is that it was built in the late 1890s so it was over 100 years old. And for that fact that it's 100 years old plus, and it's buried 30 feet below the ground, um, for obvious reasons, you know, DC Water had their concerns with, you know, trying to go down and make some sort of physical connection to this piece of equipment. Even the idea of excavating around it is something that we had to really think about a lot because we did not want to essentially create a problem where there wasn't one previously. So we had to look at all kinds of different um, design techniques. And I always thought that this was very interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. Uh, sewage is not usually my thing. So it was a, a very big learning process to figure out what goes into the design of these types of systems, even down to, you know, putting in a, a cement spoiler in front of the wastewater supply so that any large objects that might be flowing down there are, are going to tend to go past uh, the, the supply water connection. And then having, you know, large bars that allow for, um, you know, larger objects to not get into the wet well, to not clog up the screening process. So there was a lot of, of back and forth uh, between the design construction and DC water teams to figure out, you know, what is gonna make the best sense for our project. 
So here are some images of kind of how we started with the sewer. Um, so image number one, that is an actual image of the sewer that we were tapping into. I think everyone was very pleased to find when we started to evaluate what was there, that it was in excellent condition for its age. Uh, we really couldn't have expected any better. So before any uh, excavation started happening, um, some reinforcing needed to happen to the sewer. And so uh, image number two shows the, the teams that were sent down into the sewer, sewer to essentially uh, apply what we call a geocrete pro product. And this was essentially done to reinforce the section of the sewer um, that we were going to make our connections, and then also reinforce sections of the sewer, both upstream and downstream of where we were gonna make the connections. And again, this was essentially done out of abundance of caution that we did not wanna run into an instance when we started to excavate down 30 feet and uncover the sewer, um, that we were gonna disturb the sewer in, in any way. We didn't wanna have the potential for any sort of sewer collapse, um, there was actually concern of the sewer toppling once we started to excavate to the sides of it, just based on its size. Um, so we're, we really worked through a lot of design scenarios um, so that everyone would feel comfortable that we were doing this in, in the safest way possible. So the way the geocrete system works is essentially it's a concrete slurry that gets sprayed onto the wall. Uh, and then here in image number four, you start making the holes and essentially that is where you're going to affix your reinforcing steel onto the sewer. Now, the first layer of slurry is important because you wanna affix this to um, the new concrete. You don't necessarily wanna be putting any holes in the, uh, in the brick that was existing. Because again, you know, the properties of this brick, you know, we were uncertain as to what would happen. So the idea was that, well, let's just not touch it at all. Let's reinforce the whole thing. So in image number seven, you can see um, kind of what it looked like after we did the initial slurry wall and then attached the reinforcing steel. And then in image number eight, that's where they went back, applied the final layer of geocrete. And essentially what you are left with is uh, a reinforced section of sewer. And you can see that in these images here. Um, this layer here and here that can be seen, that is actually the reinforcing layer. So you can see that it's, it's quite a thick layer um, the other thing that's worth noting in this picture is that it was very difficult on site to actually get far enough away from this to truly give the impact of how much excavation was required and how much uh, supporting there was of that excavation in order to, to create a safe working environment uh, to dig down and, and to get to this wet well, or to get to the sewer, excuse me. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that this was an active sewer, right? So it had to remain active essentially the whole time while we were doing this work, which meant that all the flow upstream of where we needed to work um, had to be diverted downstream. And so that's what you see here with a lot of these uh, tubes and, and portable pumps that were installed that, that's keeping this system working. Um, so, you know, these guys, were, these guys were the real heroes of this project, getting down in there and, and getting their hands dirty. So here you can see an image of uh, essentially the, the final product. Um, so you can see that there was uh, quite a large structure essentially built into and on top of the existing sewer system. And the reason was, again, we wanted to have the least amount of impact to this sewer as possible. It does not mean that in every case and for every project that you would necessarily need to do something this invasive. Uh, perhaps the sewer that you're connecting to uh, is a little bit smaller or is a little bit newer or, you know, it, it's just uh, set up better, I guess, to make uh, a new connection. You know, it could be slightly easier than what we ended up having to do for this project. And that's an important thing to keep in mind um, because it's not just the cost of the equipment that you're dealing with. It's not just the cost of the heat exchanger and the wet well. You just really the cost of doing all of the site work and making these uh, connections. And those are the things that need to be considered when you're kind of doing your whole feasibility analysis. And in the foreground, you can see the first uh, of several uh, precast concrete rings. This is what makes up the wet well. There are a series of rings that get set one on top of each other, and that creates uh, the reservoir where we can take that fluid from the sewer uh, and, and fill up our wet well. So let's talk about the wet well a little bit more and what it's actually doing, how it works, and the considerations that need to be made there. 
Um, as I described earlier, you're taking the fluid into the wet well. It's being screened and separated. Um, the screening process is actually something that we were very, uh, very concerned about. Again, not something that we were terribly familiar with. And so we worked uh, quite extensively with the manufacturer to understand how the system works and not to, uh, not to mention, excuse me, the maintenance aspect. So obviously when you're working with the client, you're talking about doing something like this. One of the first questions they're going to ask is, how do you maintain something like this? You know, does it require weekly maintenance, monthly maintenance? What do I have to do every year? So it was very important that we worked with the manufacturer that was essentially used to designing equipment that handles sewage. So the company that, and the, that we ended up going with that produces the, the sewer heat exchanger is actually a company that does sewage treatment and the HVAC side was a part of what they were expanding into. So they knew how to do all these things. And, you know, they were able to show us that their equipment uh, was robust. It has a very long uh, runtime. And from a maintenance standpoint, um, does not require a significant amount of maintenance. Everything needs to be maintained, but really on an annual basis. So the screening system auger it actually does not operate the entire time. It operates intermittently only while you're actually bringing flow in. So the 16,000 hours of runtime actually goes for a very, very long period because it's only running a few seconds every 10 minutes to lift those solids out. And then there is also a cleaning process where it can reverse itself. Um, and that helps keep the auger clean so that there are no obstructions. Um, this system has been up and running for some time at AGU and we have not had any issues whatsoever with the, the screening system at all. So I just wanted to highlight a little bit um, about the, the design details. So once you go from uh, a, co a conceptual level, um, okay, conceptually, we know what we wanna do. We have to have a sewer, you have to have a wet well. Well, what all needs to go in there? Well, actually quite a bit of things need to go in there. Um, there are sensors that need to be placed in for high level alarms, backup high level alarms, and again, we worked with the civil engineer and with DC Water so that everyone understood exactly what was getting installed, how it worked, that it was safe, that we weren't going to be creating any issues for the sewer system moving forward. Um, and the other reason I like to show this image is because while you understand how large that sewer is, this is a two scale drawing of how big the wet well is, right? And it's very important to understand that when you're doing these modular heat exchange type systems that you need to take into account all of the different components that are included and how big they actually are and how they're going to fit onto your site. Because while we were very fortunate uh, on the AGU project that we had the space available, we were the building was very close to the sewer line and there was space for the wet well, this may not be the case on every project. So it's something to keep uh, in the back of your mind as you're working through the design aspects. So here on the left, you can see again, uh, the beginning of the, the rings that were being uh, built up for the wet well. On the right-hand image, this is the actual screening system uh, as it was brought in and uh, left in the garage waiting for the, the wet well to be finished. On the left, you can see the completed wet well. Uh, all of the precast concrete rings have been installed. Uh, you can see some of the penetrations into the wet well have already been done, and they're lowering the, the screening system uh, into the, the wet well itself. And on the right-hand side, you may recognize this from the, uh, the main slide of the beginning of the presentation. This is essentially the, the finished product. This is what everything looked like at the end of the day. Um, you can see that there's a platform that is built into the wet well. This is actually uh, quite a bit above the bottom of the wet well. And really, this platform is meant to provide access to the majority of the moving parts. Um, it has the electrical connections are here, the controller for both the, the knife gate valve, which controls flow into the wet well, um, and also has access to the, the motor for the auger system. So it allows the maintenance crew to really get in here and do what they need to do uh, in a safe way. Um, and then if you were to take this ladder all the way down, that would get you to the bottom of the well so that you could access uh, the screening basket at the bottom and so that you could access the uh, submersible pumps uh, at the bottom as well. So the heat exchanger, let's talk briefly about the, the heat exchanger itself and, and what it's doing for us in the building. So essentially, you're filling the tank with the screened wastewater. 
Uh, inside the tank, there are submerged tubes. These are the tubes in the shell and tube heat exchanger. And those tubes are con filled with the, the condenser water um, that we are then taking to the water to water heat pump to make hot water and chilled water for the building. Uh, there's also, as part of the system, uh, what they call a water turbulence generator. It essentially agitates the water in the tank to enhance the heat transfer on, e on the tubes. And so this is a, a, a unique component of this type of system because when you're evaluating your heat exchange options, you know, for, for those on the phone who might be HVAC engineers, you know that plate and frame heat exchangers tend to be more efficient. However, there's fouling concerns when you're talking about plate and frame. So in our application, because we were putting one of these in and it was going to be the only one and it was going to do all the heating and cooling, we really wanted to make sure that it was uh, as robust as possible. One of the other unique features um, of the system is there's actually a built-in cleaning carriage at the top. And the way the cleaning carriage works is there are plastic rings that go around each of the tubes in the shell and tube heat exchanger. And this cleaning carriage operates um, you know, routinely and goes back and forth and essentially keeps those tubes clean. Now, why this was so important was, A, it allows for only annual maintenance to be done. So only once a year do you have to drain the tank uh, and essentially power wash it. And B, what it does is it maintains efficiency from the moment that you turn it on to the end of the year, you're always getting the same efficiency. And that was something that was very important to us because we needed to know that now, in month one and month 10, that we're going to be getting the same level of operation from this piece of equipment. So that became uh, a very, very important aspect. And again, there's always concerns when you're bringing sewage into the building, you know, what are the, what are the smell implications? So these hatches are, are sealed airtight on the top. And when it's done properly and put into a mechanical room inside the building, there really is no appreciable smell of sewage. So you're not really having to deal with in that room, you know, any idea that there's like this uh, raw sewage is being exposed in the room itself. So this is an image I wanted to show again uh, of how fortunate we were on this project that uh, the logistics worked out, right? So this is the, uh, on the right here is the actual wet well location. This wall would be the exterior wall to the building. And then on the other side of that wall, is the mechanical room that we carved out for the heat exchanger uh, at the garage level. So it's very important to mention because this is something that you're going to have to take into consideration when you're looking at this technology. What's not shown is the sewer that is running approximately right here. So being in close proximity to all of the various components uh, is definitely advantageous. It allows us to run a minimal amount of piping into our building, and it also allows us to run that piping only in one room. So we do not have to go across other occupied space with the, the lines which have uh, sewage coming from the wet well, which was very, very important for us. So here's an image of the actual piece of equipment being delivered. Um, they are, our, the manufacturer makes three sizes. We use the largest size of equipment. Uh, this piece of equipment can do anywhere from 90 to 130 tons of cooling, roughly. Um, a lot of that is gonna be uh, dependent on what type of temperatures you have inside and outside the building. But you can see that it's not a small piece of equipment. But they were able to get it in the building. Um, just behind here is the ramp that goes into the AGU parking garage. So the riggers were able to essentially put this on its side and take it right down the ramp. So there was nothing too invasive that needed to be done to get it into the building. And here you can see an image of after it was installed. Um, this piece of equipment was actually installed before the remainder of the construction was done at the garage level. So the room that houses this piece of equipment was essentially built around it. But that does not mean that it is not accessible. This piece of equipment can be moved. Uh, there's a double set of doors that open up that allow the tubes to be pulled out and clean, and also would allow the piece of equipment to be taken out of the room if necessary. Um, here's the final view of the installed product. You can see it's a very clean application. Uh, you can also see that the existing floor-to-floor -floor height we really maxed out what we were able to do there. We just had enough clearance uh, to get this piece of equipment into the space. And one other piece of equipment I wanted to highlight, this is uh, what we were calling the companion piece of equipment. So this here is the water water heat pump system uh, that is located one level above where the sewer heat exchanger is. And this is doing all the heating and cooling. It's actually smaller than the heat exchanger itself. Um, I know a lot of times when 
we give tours up there and we take everybody through the mechanical rooms. Oftentimes people are actually quite surprised um, at how small it is. They thought it would have been larger. Another critical piece of equipment um, that I can't really go through the presentation without mentioning is the plate and frame heat exchanger. So no, no different than how you would do on a normal cooling tower system. Um, we wanted the opportunity to do as much free cooling as possible. And so we were able to do that free cooling in this building um, because we are doing an elevated chilled water temperature, right? So our chilled water distribution temperature for the building um, for design is about 57 degrees. The fact that we have a, a sewage source out in the sewer that throughout a, a large portion of the year may be below 57 degrees essentially allows us to use the condensing fluid from the heat exchanger when conditions are favorable uh, to actually do uh, all of our chilled water needs for the building. Uh, and again, this tends to happen in the shoulder seasons or when the weather is cooler, uh, but there's still uh, a cooling demand inside the building. We can essentially divert all the flow from the water to water heat pump, both on the chilled water distribution side and the condenser water distribution side and make our chilled water with this heat exchanger and just turn the water to water heat pump off. So obviously in a net zero building, uh, that's something that you have to, to focus on a lot. And so I will end the, the presentation here with an image. Uh, I always like to show this because it highlights what the AGU project was really about. I had never uh, designed a mechanical room where they wanted to put a big glass window on it and see everything that was inside and, and make it sort of uh, educational in terms of, you know, what am I looking at in here? What does it do? What, what, what do these different pieces do uh, for the system? So. Um, it just highlights sort of how dedicated AGU was to their net zero goals and to what we were doing as a project team. So um, with that, I will open it up to any questions. Seems that we have a few of them here. So I will go to the first one. One second. So there's a question asking, how scalable is this system uh, used in urban environments, i.e., will the sewer capacity for heat exchange limit the scale Will those upstream adversely impact those downstream? So that is a fantastic question. So from scalability, it really depends on what part of the environment you're in, right? Where are you in the system? How large is it? If you have a, a, a smaller, or if you have access to a smaller flow rate, then obviously you're gonna have a bigger impact on the heat exchange characteristics there. And this was certainly something that we had discussed with DC Water as well, because you can imagine if everyone on Florida Avenue decided that they want to do this, if you're the guy at the end of the line, you are not getting the same quality of water as the person at the beginning. We were fortunate in that the sewer that we were tapping into, uh, the average flow rate, I believe, was six times the flow rate of what we needed to bring into the building. What we need to bring into the building is about 500 gallons per minute. And on average, it's about 3,000 gallons per minute. And the temperature delta, say, in cooling, how much heat we're actually putting into it, it barely raised the temperature of the downstream source. So downstream, definitely, I think there would be possibilities for other people to utilize this. But if this becomes something that a lot of people are doing, that is absolutely a consideration um, that needs to be made. Uh, let's see, we have another question here. To what degree does a combined storm uh, water sewage cause issues? Oh, I see. And then there was a scratch that you'd answer my question, but I'll answer it again anyway. It does have an impact and it's something you need to be, uh, need to take into consideration. Um, it may ultimately have a big impact or not have an impact at all, but it's something that you need to evaluate. Uh, there's a question, how much would the change in energy savings with this system? Oh, and then it gets cut off. I apologize. Um, so from an energy impact, Again, this was one strategy that we had layered on top of a bunch of other strategies with the, the radiant systems, with energy reduction elsewhere inside the building, with envelope upgrades. But from an emer energy impact alone, just putting in the, the sewer heat exchange system, I think got us between three and 5% energy savings. And again, that savings seems low, but when you're looking at it, it's in comparison with all these other uh, systems that are kind of layered on, pro on top of that. Uh, there's a question, was the wet well in public space? So the wet well was actually at what is known as the prow of the building. And so there's a small courtyard area there uh, that is actually still on the AGU property. Um, but it was something that we had discussed in terms of getting public space permits. Had that been considered public space, 
Um, the district was open to allowing that to, to some degree. But in our case, again, it was, you know, the stars were aligning and things were where they needed to be um, on our particular site. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, I heard that DC Water was considering metering and charging for effluent used by a project much like they do for domestic water. Is this a consideration? Um, so that absolutely uh, is a consideration. And there's, you know, we've had conversations with folks over at DC Water about this. And I think that's what initially piqued their interest in the system. Um, obviously, as, as we become more water efficient, that means that DC water is selling less water, right? And so they look at this as something that could potentially uh, be a resource. Uh, how do you price the system and what are the variables or rules of thumb? So we always get the question about pricing and I hate to give this answer because it's a very engineering answer, but it just depends. On the equipment itself, um, obviously we were procuring this equipment five or six years ago and we're some of the first people to do it. And so unfortunately, when something is not real well known uh, in the industry, there, there, you typically have a premium price for that. But we evaluated the pricing and it came in, you know, in terms of the water, water heat pump with the sewage heat exchange system versus independent chillers, bullet boilers, cooling towers. There was a premium, but it was still feasible. And the thing that you really need to have to factor in on the cost is some of the images that I showed that have uh, essentially showed the extent of excavation that's required. That ended up being the, the thing that really drove this project. But to AGU's credit, they were committed to using this technology and they understood that, you know, okay, it's gonna be a little harder to dig down and make the connections and that's gonna eat into the, the sort of life cycle cost savings and the potential payback. But AGU owns, operates that building and plans on being there for, you know, 30 years plus. So it extended our window in terms of what was going to make sense. Uh, let's see, uh, there's a question about the payback period. Um, so we've been asked not to really get into too much of the particulars on the dollars and cents, but again, the payback period that we're looking at here was definitely over a scale that might be beyond, you know, your 10 years or something that, that people would look at normally. But again, that's the all in cost for all of the, uh, all of the, uh, various components that are not necessarily HEAC related. Um, there's a question from, oh, Luke Dorna. How you doing, Luke? Uh, Luke's a former coworker of mine. Did you guys consider water saving, savings as a benefit given there are no cooling towers? And if so, what were they? So essentially, our building uh, also, which I didn't get into in this presentation, has a, a massive rainwater storage tank. So our water usage in the building, um, the only potable water usage that we are using is essentially at showers and drinking fountains. That's it. Everything else in the in the building is, is reclaimed water. Um, okay, so we got about two minutes left. I will try to get to as many of these as I can. Uh, so there's a question about, uh, could you please explain once the, the heat exchanger system? Uh, I'll have to follow up with that one because I think that's gonna be a, a bit of a, a lengthier, uh, a little lengthier response. Uh, there's a question of, can we score good lead credits? Uh, absolutely, uh, you can. Uh, I don't know if it's still true, but at one time, I think that this project had achieved more lead credits than any other project um, has ever. Uh, there's a question of, can we get a PDF of this presentation? Uh, absolutely, uh, I think in the follow-up information that will come uh, after the presentation that um, you'll be able to, to download a copy of the, the presentation. Uh, there's a question, and I'll make this the last one. Uh, what is the building's EUI operating at? So we're still, uh, construction is, is just finishing up. We haven't started the clock on uh, their net zero aspirations. We still gotta get some uh, solar panels and things, but I will say that the, the building is designed to have an EUI of a little bit over 13. And with that, I'd like to wrap it up and can't wrap up a presentation without talking about the next one. So I hope you'll join us uh, two weeks from now uh, when my coworker, Arash Armir, is going to present uh, Energy Modeling and Optimization 101. Uh, Arash is the, the head of our energy modeling group in the DC office, and uh, I expect this to be a very, a very good and a very engaging presentation. So I'd like to appreciate, uh, or I'd like to say thank you to everyone uh, for participating, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.